I was wondering if anyone's going to show up to this press conference. <laughs> <laughs> so we have everyone here. All right. Very good. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. I'm State Senator Scott Dibble, and uh, I'm the chief author in the Senate of the medical cannabis bill. Happy to be standing here with Representative Carly Moline, my counterpart in the House. And I'm really happy to be here today to announce that we do have an agreement on establishing a means by which Minnesotans can gain access to medical cannabis in Minnesota. Uh, and should the uh, legislature uh, choose to act affirmatively on this proposal, uh, folks uh, would have access at, in the middle of, of next year, ideally. Um, but I first want to start off by um, thanking my good friend and my counterpart, Representative Moline, who has been an awesome champion and an amazing fighter for those in particular who are suffering, who have no voice of their own. And even though our bills uh, maybe took some interesting political paths and kind of went in different, uh, different uh, ways uh, politically and in terms of policy approaches and proposals, um, all along, it can't, cannot be doubted or denied that we shared very core, very fundamental values and goals. And of course, we've talked a lot about those. Most importantly, people in Minnesota who are suffering today, who have no good options or no options at all, can have the hope of gaining some relief. The other very important goal that we had was that we make some progress, that we pass an important step and pass a bill um, this year. People have been asking us to do this uh, for many, many years. There have been many efforts legislatively. Um, the movement has been built. The public supports this. And the time had come to take this important step. So I'm really proud of this agreement. I think it is an important step. It's an important framework. It works uh, really, really well. Um, I'll very, very quickly uh, describe just a very, very high level overview um, some, of the, some of the key features of the proposal in front of us. Um, it is based uh, on the, the House bill, kind of as the template, uh, making use of the patient registry model. The means by which folks have access is by signing up through a patient registry in which uh, then uh, data and information around the utility and efficacy uh, of medical cannabis can be gleaned. Um, folks have access to what they need at a number of sites around the state, uh, eight sites. Um, the, the conditions by which uh, folks uh, qualify um, continues to be by virtue of a, of a diagnosis, uh, the list of, of diagnoses that are contained in the House bill. Um, in the instance of cancer, um, if folks have uh, chronic or severe pain, chronic or severe wasting, or chronic and severe nausea, we also add the ability for folks with terminal Ill illnesses with those same symptoms um, having access to, to medical cannabis. Um, we do provide for, um, uh, we don't go to whole plant, but we do provide for whole plant extracts as, as one of the forms of cannabis that folks have access to. That's, of course, in pursuit of this goal of, of making sure that um, you know, some of these forms, uh, particularly when we're talking about whole plant, we have a number of compounds that work together, what's called the entourage effect, and we wanted to preserve that uh, for folks for whom that's an important form of cannabis to relieve their symptoms. Um, and we eliminate. Um, kind of the, the establishment and certification of those forms of cannabis um, that can be made available. Um, so, there's, so the manufacturers and, and distributors um, can formulate uh, in conjunction with the pharmacist and in, in conjunction with the patient uh, and provider community um, those forms that, that make the most sense for them. Uh, we provide for a means for caregivers uh, to help people who can't get to the sites who can't administer uh, medical cannabis for themselves. Um, we eliminate the, the courier uh, option. Uh, folks can have someone go and, and help them get what they need and, and bring it back to them. Um, we pick up a number of the protections and as well as the, uh, the violations for breaking the rules and breaking the law that are contained in the Senate bill. We also pick up some of the security measures for the sites and facilities um, that were articulated in the Senate bill. Um, we. Um, 
step back a little bit um, the ability to extend the deadline uh, that was contained in the House bill. There was a potential up to 18-month delay before cannabis is made available to folks. Um, that stepped back to just a one potential six-month delay if things aren't coming together the way the commissioner needs them to. Um, and even though uh, we provide for two manufacturers and, and eight sites total for each, um, still uh, provide for some uh, ability to uh, have the commissioner examine the financials and the pricing structures um, so that we have a real handle on uh, you know, guard against uh, some monopoly pricing, some price gouging that might occur. We think the market will take care of that, but we allow for some audit functions that the commissioner has the authority. Um, and we uh, are also uh, making sure that parents uh, can be caregivers and take on the responsibilities that they need to have uh, on behalf of their kids to acquire and uh, maintain custody of, of the cannabis and, and administer it and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, with that, did I miss anything? Uh, so. All right. With that. Um, yeah, eight, okay, eight yeah. distributed geographically. Um, uh, Representative Carly Moline. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think Senator Dibble did a really great overview of uh, the compromise that we were able to reach. And, you know, I think that this is a really exciting day for a lot of people. And I want to start out by thanking the patients who are standing up here with us and the other patients in the room who. Uh, this year have spent just about as much time at the Capitol as we have. Um, you know, we've gotten to know them and their families and their names, and we've gotten to know um, what conditions they need addressed, and they have really been here to advocate for themselves, uh, for their loved ones, for their friends, in order for them to gain safe legal access to medical cannabis. And I am thrilled that we were able to accomplish that. And Senator Dibble has been a champion um, throughout the session to advocate for these patients and the fact that we were able to come together with an agreement that uh, is going to be signed into law is thrilling for a lot of people who have been fighting very, very hard through um, blood, sweat and tears in order to get something done this session. So. Uh, you know, I want to just start out by thanking everyone that's been involved in this process. And, you know, I think we put together a very good piece of compromised legislation that's going to uh, help a lot of people throughout the state. Uh, I think Senator Dibble went through the um, conditions that we added and the conditions that came off the House floor remain the same. Um, cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, Tourette's, ALS seizures, severe and persistent muscle spasms, uh, Crohn's disease, and terminal illness. And, um, you know, I think that what we saw in both the House and the Senate and what we've seen all session is really strong, um, broad bipartisan support on this legislation because, you know, it doesn't matter what your party affiliation is or where you live in the state. Um, we have all heard from people who live in our districts who will, will benefit from this legislation. And so there's really a compassionate effort by both sides of the aisle to come together and um, draft this legislation. And I've been very impressed by my colleagues and very Im impressed by the dedication of um, citizens who have never been involved in the political process before who really are the ones that made this happen. So. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Representative Rod Hamilton, who I told right beforehand that he was on the agenda to speak. So <laughs> here he is. So she didn't give me time to prepare. <laughs> I just wanted to show up for my support. But I guess I'll say something that you probably won't hear from too many legislators, and that's I'm happy to be a flip-flopper on this issue, right? <laughs> and uh, I've also said only a fool and a dead man never change their mind. And a phone call and an office visit its what it takes, right? It's advocacy and meeting the individuals that we're helping. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So anyway, once you gather more information as a legislator and you become more educated on an issue, you know, it's okay to change a position, you know, once you gather all the facts. And that's why it's also important to advocate. So uh, the credit, obviously, I um, want to thank the authors and the others that have been directly involved, but more importantly, thank you to all of you who shared your story. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, and then next we're going to be hearing from Angie Weaver, who's going to talk about her daughter. And then um, Commissioner Ellinger from the Commission of Health will be speaking as well. Hi, my name is Angie Weaver. Hold on, my I'm a little shorter than he was. <laughs> Hi, my name is Angie Weaver. My daughter, Amelia, is eight years old and she is battling Dravet syndrome. What that means for Amelia is she's having 30 to 50 seizures a day. When we started this process in January, having Carly Moline and Erin Murphy come to our house and tell her story, I never thought I would be standing here today. This means the world to our family. This is going to change my daughter's life and thousands of lives in Minnesota. I cannot thank Senator Dibble and Representative Moline enough for taking this on this session. For the governor's office and staff to be willing to compromise is amazing. This is so important to us and our family. My daughter is going to be able to stay in Minnesota, grow up with her cousins, and have quality of life. I cannot express my appreciation enough. Thank you. Now we have Commissioner Ellinger from the Department of Health to come forward. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Ellinger, the Commissioner of Health. And as Health Commissioner, my job is to protect and improve the health of all Minnesotans. And since the beginning of this conversation, what I've been working for is trying to find a safe and effective way to get the powerful chemicals that are contained in the cannabis plant into the patients who really need it. And you've certainly heard the stories, and I really do applaud the work of the, the individuals who have been suffering from these various conditions that could be benefit from uh, medical cannabis who've had their voices heard and listened to and the legislators who've been working with them to move this forward. I'm really pleased, uh, you know, as I say, we're working to have a safe way to do that. I'm really pleased that the, the bill that's moving forward is, it really accomplishes that goal. It allows those who are suffering with serious illnesses the opportunity to incorporate medical cannabis into their treatment plan while at the same time this really protects uh, the public and protects public health in the state. And what I'm also pleased about is that this, this bill allows us to collect some information uh, so that we learn more about uh, the benefits of medical cannabis, when it's best used, and what doses it can be used. So the registry that we're putting together, uh, which we'll be, uh, be using to evaluate us so that we can move forward. As most people have said, this is a, a first step. Uh, we see that as we learn more, as we see the, get the experience with these conditions, uh, we will be able to move forward. So I, I'm pleased to be part of this uh, effort, uh, lauding this day, and I really want to thank all of the people who've been engaged and putting this together. It's been a good collaborative effort. We've all learned a lot in the process, uh, and I think we formed good partnerships that will move us forward to really protect and improve the health of all Minnesotans. So thank you very much. I think at this time, Senator Dibble and I or will be willing to take questions or if you want to ask questions the, of patients the as well. medical research aspect of the revised House bill that was rolled out a couple of weeks ago came under widespread criticism as, uh, you know, not really feasible fodder for clinical trials. Uh, the whole medical research component of the House bill was, was pretty widely criticized. What is the medical research component of, of this compromise approach? Uh, well, just for clarity, that was um, before the bill ever got to the House floor. There was a clinical trials um, proposal. We then went to more of a patient registry observational research proposal, which was in the House bill. And I think that's a lot of what's encompassed here. So um, the Department of Health will be getting information on what cannabis is being um, supplied to each patient and then the practitioner will provide information to the department on how that patient is responding to the cannabis. So they'll be able to collect that information and um, as the commissioner stated, get a better idea of how people are responding to the medicine. Are you more satisfied with the, the research component of the bill at this point? Yeah, I think uh, um, I've, I've maintained all along that uh, research information, data, more knowledge about medical cannabis, um, its uses, its efficacy is important. The goals of providing medic medical cannabis are not 
in, in conflict with the desire for, for more research. I think where we all agreed was a significant breakdown was waiting for, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials approved by the FDA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was probably not going to happen in a timely fashion to get something into the hands of folks who need it who have no other options. What this does is it gives folks access um, who need it, um, but then also kind of marries up this idea. And there can be no doubt that a lot of information, a lot of data is going to be collected. It is pharmacists who are going to be um, working with the patients uh, on the specific um, forms and, and doses, uh, and they're, collect they're going to capture that data, um, send it up to the, to the uh, commissioner, to the Department of Health, the practitioners, the doctors are going to be, uh, have an ongoing uh, patient relationship uh, and, and reporting regularly on what's going on with that person. Are they having some benefit? So there'll be a lot of data. I think it's going to be a rich, rich data set that'll be extremely useful to a lot of folks. Senator, there are those who will say that unless the leaf is available, that you're not going to help the maximum number of people. How do you respond to that? Well, um, to, to be sure, um, uh, you, know, you know, there are folks who, who, um, who may not get what they need from this proposal. Um, but, uh, but we did include whole plant extracts um, and, you know, and folks can then consume the whole plant extracts in a, in a number of ways, um, including uh, vaporizing, um, you know, in, in other ways. Uh, and, and that will contain all of the compounds and all the substances working together. There's, there's a, a bit of research and data to show that um, with the whole plant extracts, what they call the, you know, the, the 480 compounds that you find in cannabis that work together uh, and interact in ways that we don't fully understand. Uh, with the on, what they call the entourage effect um, are available through that means as well. Can so, you Can you clarify the language when it comes to pain, intractable pain, chronic pain? Do you have to be terminal for pain to qualify? Can you talk about that? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so first of all, it's important to know that, uh, you know, intractable pain, pain that's not responsive to any other form of treatment, not connected to a specific diagnosis of a disease, um, is, is uh, one of those symptoms or conditions um, that was amended uh, on the House floor to be the first thing that the commissioner looks at to add to the list. Uh, folks who are experiencing what we don't call a intractable pain, there's a specific definition, but chronic or severe pain um, that's connected to a cancer diagnosis or a terminal illness um, are allowed to access cannabis. Correct. So what's the current estimate of potential patients benefiting out of this? I don't know. Well, it's Similar to, I mean, it's hard to know. We don't have any cap on enrollment or anything like that. Um, so the Department of Health estimated under the House bill that there would be around 5,000 enrollees um, based on what conditions are in the bill and, and whether or not they seek the treatment of medical cannabis. So there's, there's too many unknowns with, with whether or not they'll seek that, which is why we don't know solid numbers. But there's no cap on enrollment, but the department is estimating um, a little over 5,000. What was the toughest hurdle to overcome with law enforcement uh, of all the many issues you had to deal with? What, what was <coughs> the most significant thing you had to do to get them to at least not oppose this? Uh, well, I think their main issues were limiting the number of distribution sites, which is why we finalized on the number of eight statewide distribution sites. Um, and also the you know, green leafy product, what you would traditionally think of as marijuana plant product, uh, they were concerned with that being in the bill, which is uh, why we allow for the whole plant extract, but not the plant product. And are they just remaining neutral on this, or are they backing this? They're remaining neutral. Have you had to adjust the cost of the program up because you've expanded the manufacturers and the distribution centers? Uh, We'll be getting a final fiscal analysis here pretty quickly, but we don't think that there will be much of a change, if any. How did you determine, how did you determine a conditions list and you're missing, or you're, you have certain things that are excluded like PTSD or TBI, um, so the veterans community is basically out of this picture, is there, is there any concern there? Oh, absolutely there are concerns. Uh, it gives us, uh, you know, no, no pleasure. Um, to, to think about, uh, you know, I mean, this was a compromise, you know, and so it was, it was a process of, of working back and forth, figuring out the cost drivers, of course. Um, uh, you know, this, this bill uh, uh, has to be supported through a, a general fund expenditure. 
Um, so that's part of the issue, um, working in conjunction with, um, you know, the medical community and, and their opinions about, um, you know, where, where we know um, benefit is derived. Um, it's not a, not a perfect uh, process, um, but it's a process of deliberation and compromise and weighing uh, different factors and different stakeholder considerations. So patients with qualifying conditions under this bill, will they be able to stay with their own doctor? Or yeah, the, the question was if folks in here, folks be able to stay with their doctor, uh, absolutely. Um, there's no limitation on, you know, your doctor, of course, uh, would, would need to agree um, uh, to be a part of, of the uh, patient registry and, and, the, and the data collection and, and, and the part of the study. Um, and uh, patients would, of course, have to agree to uh, continuing care uh, with the doctor. So it's not a one visit out, get your prescription or, you know, get your <coughs> diagnosis and then you're out because uh, it's an ongoing process of, of, you know, an ongoing doctor-patient relationship. So I, I wanted, before I forget, to acknowledge my colleagues who are here, Representative Phyllis Kahn, Representative Karen Clark, Representative Frank Hornstein, uh, Representative Pat Garofalo, uh, Representative Dan Schoen, Senator Tony Lorry, uh, the amazing, indefatigable House Majority Leader Aaron Murphy, who has put a lot of time and effort. I appreciate that. Representative Leon Lilly as well. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Rod, well, Rod spoke. He already got his time in the sun. So. You had said that uh, you were considering moving if this did not pass. Would you talk about that just a little bit more? Uh, that would have made uh, quite yeah, quite a change. <laughs> so uprooting your family, moving to Colorado. No, this, this, this bill, oh, hi, I'm uh, Jeremy Pauling. I'm from Montevideo, Minnesota. Um, this bill here helps us stay in, in, the, in the state and with our grandparents and aunts and uncles and all them that help support us with the days we got going, got left with our daughter, Caitlin. And it, it, it makes it easier for us instead of uprooting or splitting our family in half and keeping her away from her other sisters or her, her other family. What's this been like for you over the last few months? Uh, I've talked to both of you many times. So it's coming to today. What's it been like? You know, it's been like the wildest roller coaster I've ever been on. <laughs> you go from a bill stalling to um, the representatives and the senators sitting up and listening to what we got to say and getting something going again. And uh, to today where uh, it's every, taking every part of me not to cry right now because we, we've gotten somewhere. And uh, it's been a long road, but now I can get my daughter the medicine she needs. For the, for the lawmakers, are, are either of you worried at all about federal hurdles to, to making this all happen smoothly, or do you feel pretty confident that come next July, this access is going to be there? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not concerned about federal hurdles for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're not uh, undertaking uh, federally approved clinical trials and, and all of that. Um, you know, some of the issues around uh, professional licensure, I think we've addressed in, in the bill, you know, the docs and the pharmacists. Um, and, and we know uh, from the experience of, you know, the 21 other states that have this, that um, the feds, you know, are just not bothering uh, to, to interfere in states that are, are doing this for themselves and for their citizens. What when is going to hit the floor? Uh, we're we're uh, planning to have a conference committee at 3 o'clock today. Room 112, I think, unless uh, all of that is subject to change. Stay tuned. Um, and uh, then I think we'll, uh, it's a Senate file, so it's first taken up on the Senate floor. We'll try to deal with it uh, tomorrow on both the Senate and, and the House floor. Tomorrow. Does this help precipitate an early end of session? <laughs> <laughs> all that, that's, that's above our pay grade, this early end. <laughs> Without the majority leader. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could the policeman among you, the policeman among you, step up? <laughs> do you think that your I know you support this, but do you think your colleagues will, in the law enforcement community will fully support this? Do you see any problems down the road? Uh, I personally believe that uh, majority of my colleagues that work uh, the front line supported this from the beginning. I mean, it's about compassionate care. I'll just say this bill is going to be it is the strictest and most regulated in the country. You have eight limited or, well, ten limited access points, two manufacturing facilities and then eight distribution centers. Can you imagine if you had to work that hard to get the rest of your medication and how limited that was? If you did that with OxyContin, we'd probably have more people alive today. So, I mean, that's just, uh, this, is, this is a great 
proposal that takes great strides towards the concerns of public safety and compassionate care. Since uh, the timing of action on the floor is partially contingent on bonding, it's, it seems related to ask, are you doing bonding on the floor today? Uh, yeah, that's our plan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.